Go! All right, welcome to episode 13 of the Quotes and Chokes podcast. I'm Nick Angeloni. And I'm Arut Pogosian. And our guest today is Joe Fritz. Uh, Joe's one of the best performance psychologists in the business. I personally work with him. Corey has worked with him and a bunch of other of our teammates have worked with him. And all of us have seen immense results. So uh, we're here to learn from Joe today. Uh, we also have special guest, Sean Date. Uh, Pro fighter out of uh, Sparta Combat League. Yeah. Right. yeah. Nice. That's a promotion. Thanks, you guys, for joining us. Absolutely. Happy to have us. Happy to have us. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> Happy you're having Thank us. You. Thank you. We're off to a good start. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for putting that one out. <laughs> we'll just let it slide. <laughs> it's all the time. Oh, awesome, man. <laughs> Dude, I drive my wife crazy because she'll always, like, we'll get in arguments and, like, like, we're having serious arguments and she'll try to, like, Come up with some good point, <laughs> and I'll just like correct her grammar or something. Just like, Fuck it, shit. There's nothing more off-putting than that. Uh, <laughs> when you put in your heart and soul into something that you're saying, and then fucking interruption like that. Yeah. It's, it's good, man. It's good. All it's right, like, so um, uh, so tell us a little bit about what what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, first, I do have to say, for ethical reasons, I am not a licensed psychologist. So. Okay. Um, I have a, I'm a master's level practitioner, so I'm considered a consultant. Just have to say that if anybody keeps calling me a psychologist. MSW? No, so that's a social, that's in social work. Okay. So I have a master's in, uh, in sport and performance psychology. Nice. Okay. So, nice. Yeah, it allows me to practice. I'm a consultant. And so it, uh, it's a little different than, or it's, it's not as, it's not as uh, official as a, uh, um, a psychologist who would work with who's like a PhD or a PsyD, mm -hmm. which it gets licensure, and then they get uh, they work with they can work with a lot of heavier clinical type stuff. Are working in a uh, like NCAA level and college is gonna like they look for a PhD more research level. oriented. Not necessarily for you the can, PhDs. I mean, yeah, you can be, um, but you can also be a practitioner. So it kind of gives you um, a little bit of flexibility there, and so you have there's a, a couple of different avenues you can go, go down. There's people who call themselves life coaches. Um, for the sport and performance psychology, there's a, there's the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, and that has its own uh, certification, which is newer certification, trying to be as stringent as like social work and things like that. So, uh, is that what life coaches are? No, no. <laughs> so, because no, no, you said there was a, some people call themselves life coaches. I'm not yeah. saying what you do. No, I, I, hear, I hear the term <laughs> life coach and I'm just like, you. I'm thinking some girl on Instagram that like got into yoga and now is super spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm a life coach. I'm a life coach. So, I know a couple of those. Yeah. Well, that's why they're trying to standardize it more so that it is as stringent as like you're a licensed professional counselor, right? There's LPC, things like that. Um, and then there are people who come out and say no training at all. They just read a couple of books about it and they think they can help other people. And they, they, just feel like they call the themselves a life coach. There's nothing illegal about that. They're consulting. Anyone can consult and do anything like all right. that. So. Well, let's focus on the yes. legitimate people. All right. <laughs> so, you as a performance yeah. psychologist, as so, a performance yeah. counselor, yeah. Uh, for those that don't know, for the layman, like what yeah. is your job mainly consist of? So, I mean, it comes from... Uh, when a fighter... Yeah. When a fighter comes to see you, yeah, you know, and they want to make their mind stronger and they want to increase their performance, like what does it usually come down to? Well, I mean, it depends. It really depends on the individual, and so something that one fighter might need may be completely different than somebody else needs. Like someone could have no issues with pre-performance anxiety at all, but you have others who just suffer from that and they just fall apart on when they show up for fighting. There's others that are extremely great competitors, but they can't train well. Why does that mentality change? So it's extremely individualized about what your needs are. There's a basic framework that everybody can start from, but you kind of have to be like assimilative in a way where you absorb kind of like, okay, I have my framework, but you're telling me as the client, you're informing me what your needs are and I'm gonna work based off of that. You know what was my favorite part about working with you is that we, I came down and we talked and then we, uh, you know, there's some digging just a little bit, but it's enough digging to create a game plan, create a yeah. real action that you can take. Like for me, it was, I was already practicing gratitude, but you took it a level further mm -hmm. by saying, okay, what about you writing, write your gratitude down to solidify it. Yeah. So that was the next level. Then with Corey, when Corey was on the podcast, we talked about uh, intentions. That mm -hmm. was another thing you had him doing. So now, and 
I stole that from Corey. Nick, <laughs> Nick did too. So now yeah. every morning I wake up, I write down intentions and act, uh, intentions and gratitude. Yeah. So that's like that's an action that I'm taking to build a stronger mind each right. day, right? So it's the concrete action that I can do. Is like, you know, we're not like stuck in our feelings and just mm -hmm. it's action. Um, all right. So kind of, uh, on, on when he was saying. That reminded me of something. So you you turned Corey on to doing the gratitude journal, yeah. and then he turned me on to doing it. And so I started doing it, and I do like it. I like the way it makes me feel in my day, and kind yeah. of starting the day off on a positive note. Um, and I, I feel its benefits in my personal life, but I, how does it kind of transfer over into sports performance? And mm -hmm. you know, how does it touch on things like that? Yeah. So you have to go to like what is really happening at kind of like. You look at the very like base level or cognitive level when you are starting your day off by writing down these things that you are grateful for and then also the other side of that is also like what have i done for others and that's kind of there's kind of two sides to that. Yeah, I know that one. yeah so <laughs> so <laughs> so with uh with that if you when you go down to like the why does it actually work it's not just like oh it's all sunshines and rainbows because i'm thinking about things that are great about my day and things i'm grateful for you got to look at like um from like evolutionary psychology how does positive psychology really fit into that well our brains are wired in a way that we are always looking for things that can hurt us we're always looking for things that are danger right because that's what got us to survive that's how we were able to propagate to a certain point so we're all of our biases we always start from like from the center point we're always a little bit biased What's that? Pessimist. Right, we're, pes we're pessimists by nature. We're, our framework and how we view the world is very negative to begin with because that's a survival instinct. So, so we're building an optimistic body. Yeah, exactly. So you're, you're changing the lens in which you view the world. No matter what, hmm. we all have a way that is, the way we view the world is always going to be um, a little biased because we all have, I mean, your experience is your experience, right? It's all right. relative. So with this you're kind of tilting the, the 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 lens a little bit so that your first experiences everything's framed in that kind of more positive uh light so that innocuous email from somebody that was just asking for something maybe you didn't like them but you're in a better mood that doesn't that's not taken as negatively right like someone sends you a text message asking for something you're more likely to do that if you have a positive bias towards that person you're and you already buffer. like them so now you're the yeah. buffer and yeah. you're able to go into practice feeling better, feeling more positive, and get more and right. out of your workout. Wouldn't you say that it's a common trait among champions to be optimistic? Well, it's I, I wouldn't I can't speak for all champions, and there's always the outliers. There's always yeah. outliers, but yeah. like, in general, there's like a trend like that, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't think and I don't think optimism is necessarily the right term. And to go to the root of your question, um, from the general perspective, right? You walk into practice with a certain openness to new experiences and that's in general life in general but now put that in the context of like you're being taught you'll you get you get caught when you're when you're sparring right what's more effective is it effective to lament on the fact that you got caught or it's like why did i get caught how do i grow from this what do i do better because we get caught in situations all the time you get taken down and if you just lay there and think about how that sucks because you're so negatively biased about i never expected this to happen suddenly now your performance is suffering you're not mindful you're not there you're not present for anything and they're working their whole plan and they're completely pushing you through their stuff when you if you immediately like what's the defense of this turn turn what I, i'm just i'm just speaking from my own experience just turn into okay turn into guard what's the next defense of this oh, i got mindset. hit what's the counter? Yeah, right what's the counter and so um it's that growth exactly growth mindset from that where you are the the experiences you have the stimulus that comes towards you you see what what do i do with this how do i grow from this perspective what how do i move do I gotta take? right what's the next action not this sucks i don't want to be here yeah right? My, go ahead. Uh, there's a um, there's like a saying in fighting like champions have super short term memories. I was yeah. gonna say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Jerry Jones. That's the coach that told me that. Oh really? A good boxer has a short memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get you get hit and you you address it and then yeah. you're right back to your to your confidence. Same thing if you're looking at the previous round. Like, what does the previous round mean anymore? You're in the next round. Like, yeah. you need to ex if you're thinking about what happened before, you're no longer engaged in what's happening in front of you. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this: um, There seems to be a lot of times you see, especially in MMA, uh, just because it draws a certain personality. Um, a lot of the guys that are champions, they may have like a good, a good solid mind, like mm -hmm. in sports, 
but then they're generally kind of just crazy. Like, they <laughs> yeah. kind of suck at the rest of their life. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So, especially like, I mean, in general in sports, you kind of see the more the the more of an outlier in their sports performance they are. The kind of the this yeah. is where the you know. Um, what's uh, do you, is it? I guess what comes first? Is it is it because this dude is crazy that he's able to obsess here, or is it because mm -hmm. he obsesses that he's here? And is there a way to balance that and be able to be here on both? Front, you know yeah, I mean? that's that's a great question. I mean, is it is it taught or is it innate? Right? Is it was it something they were born with that mentality to be able to drive and to be able to be that effective in their sport? Like, look at ultra marathoners. Like, there's a certain way you have to be able to kind of shut your brain off a little bit and be kind of out of it to run for a hundred miles in like some twenty four hours, right? Mm -hmm. But they're able to do it. So what makes them different is it their training, but like what allows them to do their training. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing in my mind. Yeah. Um, but I think that you can have that mentality and then be and find that niche. You kind of fall into it. So you see these people who, like, they just are right place, right time. They're put into a sport. Like, I mean, I don't know if you know who Valentino Rossi is, like, motorcycle race, road racer, one of the nine-time world champion. He what it take his talent and then um, put in a different sport. Would he have done just as well? And so he does motorcycle racing. And even I don't believe it was him, but another rider. Um, said something about the best racer in the world could be an Eskimo living in an igloo. They just never were exposed they had to the it, opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. But that's one mentality. The other could be you, like you were taught that mentality through the tr people around you, mm -hmm. and you were the one that kind of rose above the rest to be able to pursue that. So talent, in other words, is or one aspect of talent is your ability to learn. Yeah, absolutely. You can be you can be yeah. talented at hard work. Your drive, yeah, right? yeah. talented I, at hard work. Yeah, I agree. So what, what I'm kind of getting at is always, so I'll give you a person, like an example from my, my own personal life is I feel that um, my ability to, to improve relatively quickly, you know, compared to just like your average person mm -hmm. is not from my physical talent, it's just from my unhealthy, obsessive nature. Conscientious, right? right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, like for me, it comes from my bad place, you know, like uh, yeah. uh, it's like an uncomfortable, obsessive place that drives. Oh, can I, can I say you should see him he comes to practice yeah if he has it in his mind that he's going to practice 90 minutes god forbid you stop at 89 minutes he's got to be shadow boxing <laughs> yeah. for the rest of the <laughs> well, so minutes. that's that's every, every so i practice Always. six days a week yeah. in camp out of camp six days a week twice twice a day for 90 minutes each session and then the but it's gonna if i'm out of camp obviously the intensity is much much lower mm -hmm. And it's 90 minutes, right? And like, I feel like that obsessiveness allowed me to um, come as far as I had, not, not any from any really physical talent. Um, but that obsessiveness has in the past caused like serious problems in my non-professional life. Okay. You know, um, because you can't be like that in like personal relationships. You yeah. Know? <laughs> so like, um, so, I guess my question is, is, is it possible, how do you balance it? How do you balance it? Or, not balance it, how, how do you find like a mental health but hang on to kind of that unhealthy right. drive? But drive yeah. Well, I guess I would say like, what's, does that outlet of training kind of fill that obsessive need for the day and you can go and re-engage in your other relationships and it's not obsessive or other tasks and it's not obsessive? Is that how that works for you? Not really. Oh, it's just, it kind of carries it over? It feeds itself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like it's like um, so. Like recently, I've done a lot of work on trying to, especially now that I'm married. Like I have to like learn to um, relax a little bit and not be as, as so much of a perfectionist because it affects like what I expect from other people and it's yeah. unrealistic, you know. So as I try to be healthier in that aspect, it becomes I'm just generally more relaxed. And while I'm still able mm -hmm. to do like that obsessive work, it's much harder because it just doesn't come because I'm just right. in general relaxed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say it sounds like you're introspective enough to find that the context matters, right? So you're carrying that obsessiveness into your that sport and performance area of your life and in the fighting and training, and then you're conscious of the fact that it's not as effective or not as healthy in the rest of your life. So you're able to understand that, like, I don't have to be as anxious about something. I don't have to be as um, it doesn't have to bother me as much. So you you already it sounds like you're you're very mindful of your own actions and your own obsessive nature that it allows you to utilize it effectively, and mm -hmm. then also kind of 
qual like you're never going to turn it off, but you're able to kind of suppress it a bit when you need to, right? Right, when it's right timing. You know, I was I was joking around, but I I felt the same way. Like yeah. I go through this too. It's, you need that rigidity, that structure to follow through on your plan. Yeah. But how does how do you prevent it from overlapping into your life, right? So mm -hmm. it comes down to that. Right? How do you stay spontaneous while being rigid enough to get everything that you plan to do done? Well, even the word rigid, I would say, I would want you to cut that out of your vocabulary to begin with. You don't ever want to be rigid. You always want to be open to experiences and open to your own experiences that sometimes you might be obsessive and it affects those, affects maybe a relationship around you, but your ability to rec recognize and reconcile is going to mean that that's the, where that personal growth comes into that kind of psychological flexibility. See, and this is what I thought about. I was like, okay, so there's certain things that are my pillars, like to my day, there's no compromise. This is gonna stay rigid because it adds structure to yeah. that I need. Like, I have ADD, so I'm gonna I get distracted so easily mm -hmm. if I don't have that rigidity. So, like, let's say the gratitude and the uh, uh, intentions, that's that's not negotiable. But, like, for the rest of the day, I can leave room for flexibility. Okay. You know, I mean, sounds like you're you're finding what you were saying. Yeah, you're finding an outlet for it. As long as it really comes down to kind of a, it's it's is an oversimplification of any personality trait, whatever for sure, anybody. Yeah. But um, is it negatively affecting your life? This obsessiveness, this rigidity that you have, and if you're like you found an outlet for it and you're able to satisfy that. Uh, impulse or what have you mm -hmm. in a way that is not taking away from your life and preventing you from engaging in, in and instead positive building, relationships instead yeah. building yeah instead of taking so it's like what's is it taking away from you um cool so on that let's take a quick break real fast and then uh and we'll come right back all right nice <laughs> you were talking about ultra marathoners and oh the mentality yeah, yeah like, and i said Psych like immediately I thought they're psycho and then speaking of psychos McGregor yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think first of all do you think he's a psycho um, I think he's an entertainer and I think he but realized do you see psych psychopathic tendencies in him uh, I don't I mean I don't I don't know enough about him I do think that he's probably willing to go to certain lengths to look like it in order to Make a lot, make money. Okay, that it, fool seems dead inside when I look inside. It, it takes one to know one, <laughs> yeah. and I'll tell you, he's psycho. <laughs> but you have to see him in the context of not acting, right? That's so the hard part. Right. Is, when is how much seen. of it's an act for the cameras and for promotion, and how much of it is. Listen, truly if you're willing to act like that, uh, and then I, I agree with that. If it works bit, like a yeah. duck, it talks like a duck. I think <laughs> one of the most. I mean, I guess I haven't watched enough, but one of the most authentic, I guess, expressions I've seen from him was I think after he lost to. Uh, Nate, after their second fight, mm -hmm. he lost. He lost in the second fight, right? Yeah. No, he lost the first. first one. The first one, yeah. and how he was like talking to himself in the locker room. Like, I think that's him. And he was talking to himself. Like he was sitting there, and he was kind of going over the fight in his head. Um, and he's he was. It sounded like I mean, there's cameras there, there's but he was kind humility of humility there, right? There's all that humility. I think his. This is. I mean, I'm not in the place or up to the expertise to kind of make this a professional judgment, but it's yeah. more of a. I think that he's posturing, right? He's he's doing that thing where he's puffing up his chest to be more intimidating because of his own anxieties and his own kind of internal struggle he has with his own confidence. So like he comes off that way. And I don't know if you guys know a lot about like posturing, yeah. but there's 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 a lot of uh, historical kind of incidents, for example. So the the concept of posturing if you go to if you ever read the book on killing have you ever heard of the book on killing on killing yeah it's about kind of the the psychological toll of warfare right okay so they looked at these uh they look, found these like muskets from the uh, revolutionary war and they dug them up out of these fields and they realized that half these rifles weren't even fired and a lot of them were loaded several times so it went back to the idea of like just looking like you were engaging in a fight yeah. actually was satisfying a certain level of that, that fear that they were expressing. Mm. And so only some, I think it was, someone can correct me uh, later, but I think it's wrong, only 30% of the people are actually fighting or engaging in that those battles. That that everybody sense. else was posturing. 30%. Be that yeah. makes sense because I know if I was fighting for somebody else's cause, like if it wasn't my cause, like in the war, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't follow anybody to the death, you know? Like, yeah. if it was my cause, I'd fight to the death, mm -hmm. but 
with somebody else, I'd just chill like somewhere in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't Good even pass it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but who knows, you know, if it's your homies on yeah. the side and you care about the homies, then that's different. Then it kind of becomes your cause. But I mean, think about like every time you can see people get all rowdy in public and they're going to start some, some bar fight or something like that. What does everyone do? They try to stand tall, each buff out your mm-hmm, chest. Mm-hmm. We can't help that. Like that's, that's our instincts to be and look bigger. And he's talking louder. He's talking over him. He's maintaining a certain level of control. And he's, he's showing that, look at me, look how big I am. Look how much tougher I am than you. Until they actually go and fight, we'll find that out for sure. But it might be that's how he might build his confidence. That's his process. And you know, I do that too. Like when I get scared, I think uh, naturally my body postures up. I've had reactions where I shrivel if I like, but yeah, I've made the conscious choice of allowing my body to take its natural course and posturing up. And then you just that feeling goes away. You're ready for fight mode. Yeah, I get the opposite. I feel like I like it's coil real? into myself. Like I feel like it's like a snake like coiling up, and I'm like, the more like tense I get, the more I like almost draw into myself. Mm. And like, I, and does that know, build I confidence don't, for you? Yeah, I don't like I don't like being loud. I I, you know, like mm. to be quiet, stoic, uh, and just kind of you know, best way I can describe it is like I feel like it's like a snake coiling like, up. I don't yeah. like to be loud mm-hmm. either, but I'm talking specifically about my shoulders. Like they they go backwards and my chest goes out. Yeah, and then like I feel like I'm growing into a guy. You know what? Like <laughs> it's, it's funny because like I, when I think back on my fights, um, there are a few fights that I sent out in my head that were like my best performances. And it's funny because on all those occasions, my wife or at the time was my girlfriend, or fiance. She she was like, "You looked like terrible." Like when you were standing, she's like, "You look like you were scared." Like I thought you were for sure gonna lose because I like like I've been into fights. And all my worst performances are the ones I went out there just like, oh yeah, like and, and acted tough because you know I was scared and I was playing with different ways of like handling those yeah. emotions, you know. And I've gone out there trying to act brave and then and fought dudes that I was definitely better than and just lost because it didn't, my nerves were too high. And then I've gone out there and just been like, just kind of dead yeah. face and slumped shoulders, you know. And then that was when I did the best, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's different for everybody. Yeah. But I, I, I've always thought like when, so when I see like McGregor like from the beginning when I saw him do all this stuff I would watch that and to me the impression that made on me was like that was it's not confidence it's I that it's seems to me as insecurity yeah, yeah and he's Look, trying exactly to in that yeah it's he's overcompensating so yeah. watching the press conference you'd say maybe that. we're just assuming right we don't know him well enough it yeah. might be him overcompensating yeah. 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 yeah but watching the press conference from your perspective. Does Khabib seem more confident? Again, I don't know, but I would say that his, from his demeanor, what I've seen from like just naturalistic observation, uh, he, his confidence seems to be in his just, this is what I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to do it, and it happens. And he just, he is so almost flat in his, in his affect about it. It's like the Nike sign, just do it. Yeah. That, that's to me that's the best way like I've had coaches like what, what are you doing like get loose because yeah, I'm just like yeah. standing there before a fight you know and I'm just well, like, it's what do you just, need at that given time yeah yeah yeah. Just sometimes you might need emotions. to get loose sometimes you might need to just hang out true yeah, yeah speaking true speaking on that like yeah. uh, before my last fight I and I've had this happen in the past a lot more with wrestling than I have with fighting because I think the nerves for fighting tend to be a little bit higher so I a little bit more up um I was very flat and felt like I was like, all right, dude, I need to pick myself up. And it's hard in those moments before a fight yeah. to pick yourself up, change that mindset. Like, what advice would you have to say? Like, when you are feeling flat, uh, before you turn you answer that, that what, what do you mean by flat? Flat, um, low energy, almost yawning in the back. Like, yeah, like, oh, oh, you know, this is just kind of like, center and like dude, I'm yawning. hanging out. Like, <laughs> I've literally, you know, literally hanging out in the back, yawning. I'm like, yeah. I could go for a nap. I know I got a fight. In the nap. <laughs> I could go for a little nap. Like yeah. I, I just I didn't have that nervousness that I normally would. That I've had. That I almost too. need to to perform well, and it showed. Like I came out super flat, too loose, and I got caught real quick. And then after that, that changed well, it, up. and it became you know less in my head, and I started reacting. But before I got clipped, I was way too loose, way too flat, and I didn't have you know, that kind of killer instinct that you need going into it, so. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you don't want to be so, I mean, it's term like fixed on that you have to be a certain way to perform a certain way, right? right? And so you said, in my previous fight, well, so you're using an expectation from a fight where you're fighting somebody different, you're in a different place, it was a different time, and you were a different person. So you, from the, that point to the next point, you can't expect that that's exactly what you need for this fight. Yeah. And so instead of trying to create that right and so instead of being dependent on a certain mindset it's kind of comes to this idea of what we call like radical self-acceptance like you have what you have and that's what you're going to use if it's 60 percent you're 60 percent of what you consider your 100 percent then use 100 percent of that 60 percent right and it's you can't be like there's nothing more to gain by like oh, if i got to get super hyped up because if you depend on that mindset or that mindset you're going to now have this idea of like when you're not there all you're thinking about is that you're not there yeah. and now you're not engaged and now your plan falls apart and then this person is the fighting is in charge so right. this Focus is where you, you control. cannot right. be rigid yeah right? you have to be radically accepting yeah. of what it is this is where rigidity can hurt you absolutely so like you have this I'm, I'm supposed to be so calm I'm supposed to be so hyped up and it's almost like because when you're not you're distracted yeah right so because you're you have this expectation of how you're supposed to feel and now it's distracting True. and so i mean you could go to the idea of like we talk about i'm sure you guys all heard about like flow states right mm -hmm. it's it's almost paradoxical in the way that you by trying to be in flow you're not in flow yep. by expecting to be in flow you won't be in flow when you're in flow you aren't aware of your of the flow state nor are you trying to maintain it it just is because once you notice you're out Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then once and then afterwards you might go back man I was just like it was just happening I just was flowing through the whole thing I was just so focused and everything was happening right there but it's like you won't know while you're in it you'll just be doing you gotta you're be just in, in the it. moment yeah. in the moment well not you don't have to be it's, I call it striving. So I call it like flow striving is the idea of like you're always kind of trying to like you're doing things that you know will get you there, which is like not expecting to do it and also engaging with the moment, reminding, catching yourself when your thoughts are elsewhere, when you're thinking about the previous round, when you're thinking about how you just got caught, like I didn't expect that, like what's that person over behind them saying in the crowd that caught your eye and it's like it's when you notice those things and then come back is that's when you're mindful and that's when you can actually get into those states. Yeah. Okay. And having an over stringent expectation on I'm supposed to be X is going to mean that when you're not then it's completely distracting and it's going to kill your performance because yeah. you're not engaged you're not there anymore so what about um, like let's say like in Sean's state right he's like okay I feel um, because let's say you I mean over over your experience all the fights and competitions you've had right like you've noticed like in general, I perform best like right in this zone of yeah. like nervousness, right? Um, and you're not there, and it, and I, I agree um, that it's definitely not the best thing to to, to like. Oh, Depends on I gotta get up here, right? Yeah. But there are like, okay, well, maybe I should just do some jumping jacks. You know, I mean, like, would you if you're in that situation where you're mm -hmm. feeling lower energy than you would expect, would you would you recommend just saying, okay, I'm just gonna be here? Or would you recommend saying like, it's fine wherever I'm at? But I could also do these things to get myself up. To get to that optimum range. range. Yeah. So um, I think that's the difference between an expectation of a certain body state and preparing in a way that you know is effective for you, right? So there's a difference between routine and superstition. Mm -hmm. So like superstition is this overly, like it has to be this certain way, otherwise my parents mm -hmm. will die. Um, or it has to be. It that's has out to of be, your control. I will lose if this sock, I don't pull up my left sock before my right sock or something like that. If I don't, yeah. I don't get my hands taped the same way every time, mm -hmm. it's going to affect my performance. Yeah. That's superstition. I used to have to wear the same like outfits on yeah. each like for like wrestling tournaments i'd wear like the black socks with this singlet on the yeah. first day oh really and then like yeah. this with that on the second day and like it would throw me off like and then i started like forcing myself to like wear different things and like, yeah. not no, do that's it good though. just yeah. to be like all right i can't get in that like i you know i can't fucking find my shirt i'm gonna lose this <laughs> match right like i almost force it yeah but. And so it's like, yeah, it's a difference of routine and then like superstition. Like your routine is to warm up. I, I mean, yeah, I need to warm up. I need to be loose, but it's it's about going to that place, but also not expecting it or needing it so much that it's distracting when you're not, yeah. right? So like, it's not like, oh, I'm not as loose as I was before. Or what happens if you're warming up and all of a sudden it's like, hey, it's going to be 15 more minutes longer than you thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting there, it's like, what are you like? Oh, crap. I'm not going to be as warm as I thought I was going to be. I feel really good right now. How am I going to be in 15 minutes? Like, 
you're not fighting right now. Yeah, yeah. You're just warming up, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. This is all you're doing right now. You'll fight when you get there. You'll be walking up there when you're walking up there. Just be in that like, moment. Just, I'm warming up right now. Okay, I'll warm up for a few more. I know that if I do too much, I'll get tired. Like, that's where you, you this is where kind of all the pieces come together. That kind of gratitude practice builds that psychological flexibility. The psychological flexibility allows you more open to these different experiences. Mm. And it's like, oh, I'm waiting longer or I have to be ready faster than I thought I was going to be. I didn't get to go through my entire routine. It's like, are you really going to learn anything and then the next extra 30 seconds you thought you were going to have yeah. throwing strikes in the back room? Because if you're still practicing in the back yeah, room you're before you walk out of the yeah. fight, like, are you really ready? Yeah, it didn't work for Dada, Dada 5000. Did he die? No, Kimbo died. Well, I think he like kind of died. died. That he had something like no, his heart didn't. stop or something like Dada that. Dada had like yeah. a couple heart attacks. Yeah, yeah. during the fight. During the fight. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was like the, when they were doing the open workouts, his coach was like trying to explain to him like how to throw like a hook. Oh, I was like oh man, <laughs> this is gonna be a That's long day. That's a really good example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually had a, so my very first pro fight, um, the fight before us. Uh, this is like a, a testament to local MMA shows right here. The fight before us were two heavyweights, and they broke through the cage. And they, hit, they hit the door, and the bar broke open. And so we were about to walk out because it was like at the end of the last round. <laughs> and uh, and I'm sitting in the hallway. I could see my opponent sitting in the hallway right there. And uh, they came out like, uh, the cage broke. It's going to be a while. And then, so we're just both standing there like, hey, bro. <laughs> it's like the Fisher and, Price UFC. Cuts, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> Backyard wrestling. Yeah. And I, I, it didn't throw me off, but just... Uh, just I don't know. Remind me of that story. So. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, so there was uh, there was something I was going to ask about. I distracted myself. Uh, I, I, I had a question about again going back to McGregor. And yeah, his yeah. Confidence. Uh, to me, like whatever insecurities he has and whatever posture he has, the man has won two world titles. Yeah. In the UFC, I, I think he is supremely confident. How do you develop, besides winning, how do you develop confidence like that? Like, well, what do you think has contributed to his confidence? <laughs> um, if I knew the exact answer, I would be... A world champion. Yeah, I would be doing it for my... I might be doing it <laughs> myself, but... Um, <laughs> I would say again, it's almost again. It comes back almost a chicken and the egg. It depends, right? So, does confidence build confidence, or does confidence build confidence? I think they go right? both ways. Right. So, it kind of they feed into each other. So, like showing that you're good at something gives you the confidence to be good at it. And so now it becomes really nuanced, right? So he's won two world titles, and in his mind, he's won two world titles, and he says, I've done this before, I can do it again. Did that take away from his training? Did he feel he didn't have to train as hard because he was already that good? Or did it? Or does he have the mindset that says, I have to keep training at this high of a level and then now higher because I'm a champion? Mm-hmm. So you have to go into the individual characteristics there are going to determine how he trains and how he uses that that competence to build his confidence, right? He's proven that he's great. He's proven that he is a good fighter. And now it's like, does that feed into his confidence? And is that confidence now healthy? Confidence. I was going to say, can you touch on like uh, overconfidence? You know, you know, do you, do, is there? Do you mm-hmm. feel like that is? I don't believe it. I was going to say, is there such a thing? Yeah, yeah. Again, it goes back to: is it taken away from your performance? Does believing that you can do something that is beyond your skill set allow you to be able to do that? There are times. Does that confidence and that overconfidence create that growth mindset? Create that psychological flexibility where? Just because you got hit, it's like, I don't care that he caught me and he beat me up in the whole first round. I'm still going to come back and beat on him. I'm mm-hmm. still, I know I can still beat him. Somebody who has a mentality like that is scary, in mm-hmm. my mind. So I wouldn't call it overconfidence as much as it's, it's that almost radical belief in self to pursue or to, uh, or to accomplish something. Now, it's, as long as the competition is balanced with that right it's like your overconfidence is just above your skill level i think then you can that's when you see those people accomplish those crazy say, things sometimes you see those people that are just delusional oh yeah, yeah. And you're like yeah. dude you have no business being yeah. in a smoker let There's alone you know people. thinking you're gonna go ufc right I, out the gates like, i think this is the yeah, way i think about a, it a uh, <laughs> belief plus plus action uh that's confidence belief without action that's yeah. delusion Right? Well, yeah, I mean, you can't just sit at home and be like, I'm so, I'm going to be the best in the world and never train. Like, is that you have to, like, There's you're delusion. saying the gap between it, it has to be close enough. That close enough, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that. 
I was just basically, when I asked about overconfidence, just like... You're fit, thinking fishing. arrogant. Yeah, well, I was fishing for a reason to say that McGregor is going to lose. Just <laughs> because he's overconfident? He, he looks for reasons to hate McGregor. <laughs> I saw him drinking that whiskey in the press conference. I was like, he's been drinking, he's going to lose. <laughs> Fuck yeah. And I was saying, like, one, one shot's going to relax him. You know, a little bit of whiskey is good. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, again, look at say, yeah. He used to have vodka on his breath on all of his fights. Really? Like, yeah. really? Bo- yeah, Boxer, yeah, he really always drank two beers before his really? fights. You can't yeah. do that anymore, right? At yeah. all, it's considered Who's performance. Stop you? Well, it's know. performance, right? It's performance Who's enhancement in a way, where like you're numbing you yourself. Stop you, son. you saw it? <laughs> oh, not us. Did, no, you saw it's not gonna check for alcohol after a fight, don't they? I don't think they check for alcohol. Yeah, I don't know that they would. Oh, I, I, I don't. And that, because I, I guess it's noticeable if they're like, test, huh? dude, you smell like a bar. Yeah. Like they might, <laughs> but huh? I don't know. Um, do you have anything else you want to touch on McGregor? Because I had something else. So it's gonna go ahead. Um, so I was having a conversation with one of our coaches the other day and I've kind of been playing with this um, and I, I'm of a mixed mind about it so um, what I wanted to do is obviously for everyone or for most people there's a gap of the way you perform when you doesn't when it doesn't matter and then when you do matter right and obviously that's one of the main goals of sports psychology right is, is yeah. closing that gap and so, like, in an effort to, like, start to close that gap, I thought, what if I, like, one practice a week, um, I'm going to make myself nervous, like, for that practice, right? So that I can, I can create, um, I can create pressure for myself and then learn how to yeah, form under that pressure. Good. But in at first, I was like, that seems like a good idea. But then the flip side of it was, am I creating the habit of making myself more nervous? You right. know what I mean? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'd actually go down to the base of like, what do you consider like nervous? What does nervous mean to you? From even like mental, from like psychologically or like emotionally or like physiologically, what does nervousness mean to you? Um, elevated heart rate, a little bit of, little bit of tension. Um, okay. A little bit of that, a little bit of that, that bitch voice in the back of your head. You know what I mean? Like, like oh, can you do this? You know what I mean? Like just, um, pressure to perform and. Um, Kill the inner bitch. Yeah, <laughs> and I guess honestly, so like some of the sometimes the way I the way I and now saying this out loud, I feel like this isn't the best way to go about it. But some of the times that I create that the way I create that nervousness is by saying, okay, um, if I can't do this, this, and this during this uh-huh. practice, am I going to be able to reach my next goal? You know, which I feel like is probably not a good idea now that I said it out loud. But that's <laughs> that's some of the ways. Yeah. But that's that's what occurs. That's what makes me nervous in my fight. Right? It's like. I don't care if I win or lose this one fight. Like, right. I care a little, but I care about my end goal. And then, so what the voice in my head for fights is like, I've had well, if I goals. can't win this fight, like, you know, you look at some, like, there's a, you, you look at like the records of like great, great champions, like most of them went undefeated in the beginning. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm telling myself in my head, or what I, I used to tell myself. Mm-hmm. Like, don't really anymore, but you know, so I gotta if I don't win this fight, what's gonna happen in the future? You know, so I'm, yeah. I'm recreating that voice. You know? Well, so that voice. Um, isn't helpful, right? Mm-hmm. So you, if you're thinking about the next fight, you're not fighting now, right? You're not okay. present. So it's a matter of when you develop, like if you start to do like mindfulness practice to become more present to build that presence, you would want to notice that you're thinking about future fights mm-hmm. and then come back to what you're doing present. right now. Mm-hmm. Because the more, because you think about it, it's like in order to get to that that outcome, that very that destination at the very long end of the road, you have to take all those steps in between, right? And you have to take them the right way in the right direction. Yeah. So if you're sitting and thinking about the outcome, like what's all the way down the road, like at the end of a road trip, you're gonna take a tr- the wrong turn somewhere. Mm-hmm. But if you're very focused on the 100 feet of road in front of you, that fight right in front of you, that round, that five seconds, or that infinitesimally small moment, mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. things all add up you win the yeah, we talked about this. You win that win that moment and then you win the next moment and then you win that round and then yeah. you win those two and then three that fight and then now you're another night now you're now win in practice. So right? I definitely agree with you on that and like I, I feel like that as, as like I was saying like I, I don't I realized that, that was a bad habit and kinda got yeah. away from that because I have done some mindfulness practice but um I was basically kind of using that as an example of, of my main what I, my main question is is it a good idea to it, when, when I'm trying to allow, like get myself nervous for practice, that's not the way to do it. But if yeah. you know, I found different ways now where it's like if I if I'm going to make myself nervous for practice, am I creating the habit of 
getting nervous, right? Like, let's say I go into a fight, I'm naturally nervous, but now I have a habit of making myself more nervous. But you're creating an expectation of having to be nervous in order to perform, right? Okay. Or and knowing, or it's how you're conceptualizing your nervousness is taken away from your performance. So it's like, the reason I asked you, what does that mean to you physiologically? Everything you described to me sounds a lot like excitement too, right? Yep. Your uh-huh. body's dumb. It doesn't know the difference between being nervous and being excited. Do you like roller coasters? Uh, yeah. Do you ever? Afterwards? <laughs> but, okay, good, good, good example, right? So you're standing in line for that. Everything you just physiologically described, the, the voice in the back of your head that's like, oh, okay, are you going to do this? And then your hands feeling sweaty, the tightness in your muscles, your body is preparing for something, right? Something that's making you whether you're nervous, but you're labeling it as fun and excitement in that context. Okay. And now you're labeling nervousness as like, okay, what does nervousness mean to you, right? So nervousness is something that it might be negative or it's something I have to adapt to. So instead of trying to create it, just learn to adapt to it relabel it or change maybe how you feel about nervousness like no nervous actually means that this is my body preparing to fight Mm -hmm. this is just telling me it's raising my heart rate it's it's um it's pumping more blood i'm getting sweaty because i'm getting ready to fight this is my body telling me i i'm getting ready yeah at the same time but not being dependent on that you have to be that way but how you label it's like oh i'm not nervous because i know i'm ready i'm ready because i'm nervous everybody Mm -hmm. gets the butterflies put them in formation yeah. Um, so we're we're getting close to our uh, our time cap here. Um, so how can people find you? Um, how can they look more into what you're doing? And yeah, seek so out um, I uh, right now I work. I mean, I work five days a week at Resilience Code. It's a health, wellness, and performance center over in the uh, tech center out here. Ahead of the curve. And yeah, <laughs> we do. Uh, uh, for oh. people listening, it's at uh, tech centers in Denver. Oh it's yeah, tech center in Denver. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so I'm the director of our performance psychology there as well as our concussion management training. So, I mean, you can find me. I don't have any social media at all, but uh, really? yeah, no, I don't have anything. <laughs> it sounds man. like I need to start. <laughs> well, you. after this, I was like, I need to actually, maybe I should probably uh, start actually promoting myself a bit. But I've always believed that if I'm doing good work, then people are going to find out. Yeah, yeah 100%. So, I mean, I've heard. Uh, from a view from word of mouth. Yeah. So it is working. Yeah. We got so, I mean, another minute or two though before we get into the closing out. Uh, we're gonna go over okay. our time cap anyway, right. so just fuck it. Just go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> dealing with like injuries and things like that. Yeah. Um, that takes a huge mental toll on me, especially when I'm in camp and I've got mm-hmm. a date that I need to be ready yeah. and say you know mess up. Like right now I'm dealing with a rib. Uh, just things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Things always happen in a fight camp that make it to where you might not be training the way you, in your head, need to train to get the result that you want. Yeah. How do you deal with that as far as... Well, you know, the quick answer, considering uh, the time the crunch we have. We already went over. We missed yeah. it already. So well, okay. <laughs> but even so, like, without, having, without sitting down and doing like, a full session or something yeah. like that, I would say like a really quick and I think effective answer is when it comes to recovering from an injury... You need to approach it with the same amount of vigor and same amount of motivation that you approach any training that you do. So think of how hard you train and when you wake up, you put in the hours, you put in the sweat, you push through the pain and kind of that, like, the, I'm tired and yeah. I got to keep going thing. Now go that, put that there recovery. Do the PT, do the icing, take the time off that you need to take off, and then you recover the right way yeah. so that you can get back to training the right way yeah. rather than prolonging an injury and then now you're going to miss your date no matter what because you tried to push through a rib right. injury, right? You know who really does that, embodies that? Bo. Yeah. I've seen them. Train through injury? I've seen them. Oh, win. Uh, um. Coverage injuries professional. Oh yeah, so yeah. I've seen him win the RFA title like that. He tore his knee. That fool, he'd go in the sauna, play some funky music in there, just like meditate, whatever, and that was his preparation. And he won the RFA title like that with yeah. the choke. Yeah, because that was all he could do at the time. Is that the yeah. answer your question? Shout out yeah. to yeah. Serbian yeah. Steel. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So, is there a um, so you're at Resilience Code. Yep. Did you give a website? Or way people so it's uh, MyResiliencecode.com is the is the website okay. uh, for the uh, company, and then um, me. You can find me on there, and then I guess I'll. Like, they can just call Resilience Code and buy. Oh yeah, they can talk to Joe. Yeah. <laughs> we all got computers on our phones now. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. we can figure it out. <laughs> I guess I have to make a social media account after this now. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can see it. Uh, Sean Date. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I'm giving you information. Oh, Sean, uh, <laughs> Sean uh, hopefully fight me again soon. Uh, yeah, just Sean Date across the board, Facebook, Instagram, 
don't really use Twitter, so I think I have one, but I don't know. <laughs> Dude, I you, you were part. actually like uh, early enough on Instagram that you just got Sean Date? Yeah. There's not another one out there. I don't know that there's many, you know, I don't I've know if Date's not the on. most common yeah, last name anyway. True. Dante you know? is more common. Dante. Either is Angeloni, and I couldn't get that shit. Angeloni's a little bit more. Have you met another Angeloni? That's a good uh, point. <laughs> 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 Alright, on that note, if you want to find me, um, or actually, if you want to find the podcast, you can follow the, the podcast pages on Instagram and Facebook, at Quotes and Chokes. Um, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Got it right that time. Um, just look up Quotes Fourth and Chokes. Fourth time's the charm. Fourth time. We've been on Spotify for like a month now. I keep forgetting. <laughs> um, so, uh, Quotes and Chokes, find us on there. We're also now on YouTube um, under the same name, Quotes and Chokes. If you want to follow me, at Nick Angeloni 155 on Instagram. On Facebook, it's Nick the Italian Stallion Angeloni. And that's <laughs> always a mouthful, huh? <laughs> it's uh, a long one. <laughs> and uh, Prime underscore time for 9999 for me on Instagram. Nice. Cool. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Thanks for coming, Joe. Thanks, guys. Go!